Hi, everyone. My name is Victory. Um, I'm a junior here at MIT, um, studying 6-7. And I took Web Lab last year in January as well. Um, so this is how Web Lab was for me. It was very overwhelming. There was like a lot of content. I think Web Lab staff did such a good job of... Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think Web Lab staff did a really good... Okay, I'll just wait. Thank you. For... Oh, I should have like that. Oh, my God. Okay. Okay, yeah. So WebOps staff did a good, really good job of like explaining everything. And then I did the project with one of my teammates. So we built InstaSpam, which basically is like a dorm spam scraper. Um, but we built it like in the format of Instagram, sort of. So like you can like browse through. It's still hosted because I think we transferred ownership over to like WebLab staff. Um, and you can like scroll through and like any unread dorm spam emails that you have will be visible. And then you can like mark it as read or flag them. Um, and then it like show up on your profile so you can go back to them. So it's just like an easier way to keep track of Dormstam. I, I personally still use it. I didn't really share it with people, I guess, which probably I could have. Um, but if you want to use it, you can. But that to say before taking like web lab, I didn't know anything about like React or like Express or MongoDB. I think I knew like a bit of HTML, but I also barely knew CSS or JavaScript. So web lab really helped me learn a lot of things. And I'm sure it's helped you guys learn a lot of things too. And you learn a lot more from like building a project. Um, so yeah, and then after Web Lab, I was really inspired and wanted to like continue building more projects. So I started doing like hackathons and then also started doing like job searches within. So like Web Lab really inspired my interest in software engineering. And then I did a lot of recruitment this past um, cycle um, and got like a good number of offers, um, some in software engineering, some in like research, so, like Microsoft research, um, and then one more in like AI slash software which was with Google DeepMind, which is like AI, um, Google's research group. Um, and then with like Google software engineering, I didn't actually finish the process. I withdrew my application because by, by that time I had other offers I was interested in, but I still put it on there because I went through the entire process um, and got to like the final stage, which is like matching the projects. Um, so that's how I'm like going to talk to you about like how to convert your web lab. So I feel like web lab was like one of the biggest components of like my application process. And it was very, very helpful for me because I talked about it a lot during my interviews. Um, and I think it helped like get past the resume screens. Um, and yeah, so I guess how, oh yeah, the goal of this is to like monetize your web dev skills. So like, yes, with like WebLab, you can build really cool projects and do things and like maybe like down the line, create a startup or something or like build a website to like solve a problem that's interesting to you. But you can also make money in the process and like sponsor your college feeding and all of that. Um, but so what is like software engineering entail? I didn't really know too much about software engineering or like what it was before taking web lab. Like it was just like a buzzword and everyone, cause you go to MIT and like so many people are doing SWE. Um, but like SWE entails different things like backend, front end, and full stack, which you guys know about after taking web lab. So, you know, like backend stuff is like doing things with like APIs and like Node.js um, and doing all the stuff that happens behind the scenes. And like front end is like more like JavaScript and blah, blah, blah. And then full stack is a combination of all of that. So being able to do it. And WebLab gives you skills to be able to do that as a software engineer. So you're not going into an internship like knowing nothing. Um, there's also other aspects of it, like doing mobile app development, which I really want to explore um, and like more architecture infrastructure. I won't really talk about these. You can Google them if you want to learn more. And there's also like other niche specialties that you can look at, that you can look up. And it usually varies by company. So there's usually like different divisions. Um, and then this is an example. So you're probably not gonna like work on writing hello world in different languages as a software engineer. Although I've heard some people have like bad projects, but sometimes you get lucky and you do like something really cool. So one of my friends actually this past summer implemented the select all feature in Gmail um, for iOS. So like you probably didn't, I, I didn't even know I couldn't do that with like the Gmail app. But like you can do like select all your emails on the website, but you couldn't do it for iOS until he implemented it this summer, which is super cool. So like imagine getting to do that. Um, you can check if you want to, but you can now do that. Um, so like what steps should you take if you want to be able to do something like making Gmail better? This is a really like lucky project, by the way. Most people don't get to do stuff like that. Um, but you do still get to do like sweet related things, which can be cool. So first thing I'll say is like to update your resume. So this is how I updated mine after taking web lab. Um, so I put like what I did is an Insta spam and I created a project section for the first time because I didn't really have any projects until I did web lab. My hack MIT project before that was really crappy. <laughs> um, so it wasn't like an actual project. Um, it was just something we have to put together to submit 
um, when I did it for the first time. So create project section, or, or if you have just one project, you can put it under experiences, because I don't know if it really makes sense to have like a project section and just have one thing under that. You can also do like projects from classes, so like 009, like Lisp interpreter. Um, although I've heard like, if it's something that's specifically tied to a class, it's not as impressive, but I think it's like fine. Um, and then I'd say include details about architecture. So like I mentioned that we use the Microsoft Graph API, which is one thing I think made our project successful. It was kind of hard to work with Microsoft Graph's API because that meant you had to access um, MIT student emails and like create an app that could do that. And then IST was like, we're not gonna let you do that. Then we found a way to get around it. So like I put that in, I talked a lot about that in interviews. Um, and then continue working on more projects. So this is what my resume project section looked like right after Web Labs. So like going into the spring last year. And then this is what it looks like now. So I've done like more projects. So I did Hack MIT again, and that was like really, it was better because I used like my web lab skills for Hack MIT. And then I also did AIM Labs, but I updated my Insta spam section as well to be more comprehensive. Um, I remember someone reviewed my resume and they were like, they liked the fact that I put that we came fourth overall because that showed that we actually did something that was probably meaningful. Um, and also you don't have to like get a prize in web lab for your projects to be meaningful. Um, but like being more specific with those details, like saying like you, I put the MERN stack, which is like MongoDB Express, React, and Node.js. I think like most people or like most recruiters um, will know what the MERN stack stands for, but it's also in like my resume skill section. Um, so I also updated my resume skill section after taking web lab. I didn't have any of this stuff, I think except HTML in there um, for that. And I linked some resume templates that might be helpful. I think the most popular one is called Jake's resume, which is the second. So you can use like LaTeX to put your resume together. I actually used Word for mine and I don't remember where I got the template for mine, but I think Word was helpful because it helped me like cram, cramp a bunch of stuff in, um, which in hindsight isn't really that like necessary. Like my resume is a lot more sparse because I took out a lot of things. Um, but in the past it was very cramped and Word was helpful for cramping. Um, and then I'd say like, it's helpful to do it with people. So like going through the recruitment process by yourself can be very difficult. Um, so like you can do it with your friends. I think like upperclassmen is all very helpful. Shout out to Tony. He's not here. Oh, oh, <laughs> okay. Shout out to Tony, who's one of the web lab instructors. Cause I asked him for advice when I was also recruiting. Um, and he like interned um, at Microsoft previously. So I asked him a lot about that. He's very cool. Um, and then there's also other communities you can join. Some of them are targeted for like specific like identities or like minority groups. So you might not be eligible to like join every single one of them, but you can like look up more or look into whether or not you actually can join. Um, CodePath is really cool in my opinion, because you can take like advanced like web dev or like iOS dev or like um, technical, some, like a class on like, um, a class on technical suite prep yeah, you get what I'm saying. Um, but I actually didn't take any of the code path classes because it was too much to handle during the MIT semester. So I just ended up not doing them. But if you do have time to take them alongside classes or do it over the summer, it can be helpful. And if you're like eligible to also do it, but you don't need any of these really to be successful. I think the most helpful thing for me was other MIT students that I reached out to and I asked for advice um, and they can be helpful to with sharing opportunities or like prepping for interviews together with like your friends. Um, and then some people can give you referrals, but also don't worry if you can't get a referral for an internship because it doesn't necessarily like make or break. Or I've heard from, from many companies, it doesn't matter too much. So it's also fine. Um, yeah, and then finding job listings. I think like we're all MIT students, so you're pretty resourceful and you know how to find things and do research. Um, this was someone I found very helpful. I turned on his post notifications on LinkedIn and he would like post as soon as job jobs came out or like internships came out. And that was very helpful. Um, also just like communities that you can join or like clubs sometimes post listings. LinkedIn is really helpful. Sometimes like random, like Apple software engineers would just be like, we're looking for a student to do this. And then you see people commenting their emails. I don't really know how successful or helpful that is, or if people actually get jobs through that but I have heard one person get a job through that. So I think it works. I've never done it, but I've seen like those those posts, those types of posts on LinkedIn. Um, and then this was a GitHub that had a bunch of opportunities. It will be updated for next summer. So like if you keep it in mind, it's like Pittsburgh CS something. Um, but yeah, this is this was for this summer. 
um, or this coming summer. And then you can subscribe to the mailing list to get like updates about when it's updated. Oh, MIT's CS opportunities listing is really helpful, like especially because alums just like send stuff there. And sometimes you can get like an IAP um, internship in like New York City or something to do SWE. And that can be um, also a good way to, oh, I did not mean to do that. Get your foot in the door. Wait, how do I make this full screen again? Uh, oops. Bottom left. Oh, okay. Thank you. And I did it again. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then Handshake also has opportunities. This is for freshmen and sophomores. Um, yeah, you can look at I think you guys will have access to these slides. But again, for like the summer after summer 24, there'll probably be like an update to those. Um, I think conferences help if you can get funded to go for conferences or you're part of like groups that identify with conferences that are hosted. So for instance, I went to Grace Hopper and that was helpful for me um, for like Bloomberg and for DeepMind. Um, and then also upperclassmen, especially just like telling people that you're interested in applying for C so they keep in mind when the opportunities open up. So these are timelines. Um, so for summer 24, like you, many of you may already know all these things that I'm saying. So apologies if this is very repetitive, but for summer 24, most recruiting or for any summer, the recruiting starts the fall before. Um, and then some people do internships like during the semester. So like fall or spring. Um, I think the general rule of thumb is like think two semesters ahead, basically. So IEP is usually early fall and you find lots of opportunities on Handshake. Um, but for fall and for spring, think like fall, think in the spring, spring, think in the summer up until the, the end of the deadline or of the cycle. And like you can also start the coding um, I haven't mentioned what lead coding is, but I, I'm going to mention that in two slides. But for IEP, I know some of the internship opportunities don't make you lead code, which is kind of nice because then you can also get your foot in the door for like sweet. Um, and also I used this template to keep track of my of my um applications. I modified it a lot because there are some things in there that I didn't think were necessary. But if you're looking for something to help keep track, that might be helpful. So the sad reality is like, if you're trying to recruit for software engineering internships, you're probably not actually going to be asked like Svelte or React. Um, you're going to have to leak code. And I didn't know this. I wish someone told me this last year or earlier, but like, I just like, like when you talk to people, you find out that you should be leak coding to get a job um, because you might just end up, wait, sorry. Um, in an interview and not know that they're going to ask you data structures and algorithms. So like things like arrays and strings, um, some of this you're exposed to mostly in 009, um, two pointers, linked lists, graphs and matrices, and dynamic programming could get really unlucky. Um, I found this website to be helpful for learning, for like solidifying data structures. I also found 009 to be very helpful. Then I took 006 as well. And 006 was helpful for DP, so for dynamic programming. And I think like, graphs and uh, graph searches. Um, but without 006, 009 is really good. Also, you can just like teach yourself these things. Low key, like you don't actually have to take the classes. Um, so if you have the time and you're ready to like commit to that, you can. Um, and for like the process of lead coding, so lead code is like this website that has a bunch of like practice questions within like the realm of data structures and algorithms. So you can check out this website called, or this website that has a link to this collection of questions called Blind75, which basically selects like the most relevant lead code questions for interviews and gives you like an idea of where to start or like what questions to start practicing with. Um, and then I use Necode Roadmap and I know a lot of people use Necode now. So Necode was created by this guy who, who worked at Amazon quit his job, then worked at Google, then quit his job again. But he created like a bunch of solutions to lead code questions, I think to everything in Bind75. And his solutions are really, really good. Um, but then he created this need code roadmap, which basically like allows you to have a good flow for practicing questions. So not like just like randomly doing lead code questions. If you start with like array questions, then you can progress to two pointers and then to sliding window and then eventually get to like graphs and stuff. So I found this really helpful and it's helped me go through. As you can see, I never actually like did all the questions. Um, I think I did like a, on this, I think it was like 35 questions and that was okay. So you don't have to do like every single question to be amazing or to, to get a, a job. Um, 
Also, if you subscribe to Lead Code Premium, you can get company specific questions. So let's say you have like an interview coming up. For some companies, there are questions there that are specific to companies. I've actually like had Lead Code Premium questions that I've practiced come up in an interview, but that was like twice. So it doesn't always help, but you can see um, practice questions that or previous questions that have been asked by the company on Lead Code if you subscribe to Premium. Um, also, you don't have to pay for premium. You can just ask, like I've not pre paid for premium. I just asked people and then I found someone who had a premium account. Um, and this is a, an example of a lead code question. I put this one because it was one of my favorite questions, but we're not going to talk about it. It's just like, what this is what the interface looks like. This is what lead code looks like. Um, so after finding jobs, then you actually have to start applying. And then the resume that you updated with your web lab skills and any other like skills that you have um, that are relevant to software engineering, you can submit and then you will get online assessments. So you might have to take, you will probably have to take a timed assessment. I was really bad at these at first, but if you just continue to practice lead code questions, you get better and sometimes you get lucky. Um, and like, even if you think you did really bad, you will still hear back. Um, so yeah, we don't need to talk about the, the websites, but those are examples of websites that you get like the online assessment links to. And then again, lead code questions. And then if you get past the online assessment, then you get to do interviews. I've also heard some companies don't have online assessments. I know like, um, I think Microsoft doesn't have an online assessment. Don't fact check me on that because I never heard back from Microsoft for software engineering. Um, so for technical interviews, there's they're basically like these 30 minute to an hour, depending on the different companies. And there's there can be like different amounts or different numbers. Like you can have like one or you could have like four. Um, and during these interviews, you walk through code and like live code with an interviewer. And sometimes you have to run the code. Um, you can get free mock interviews on here. The caveat being that if someone interviews you, you have to interview them back, um, which is not bad. And you can also just like ask people to interview you. But things they look out for is like communicating. So like if you're writing code, like talk through your thought process. I also won't go into too much detail about prepping for technical interviews because I include links to like, things or websites that talk more about how you should be approaching these interviews, but ask questions. Um, even if you don't offer multiple solutions, talk about like what weaknesses your solution has. Um, and then runtime is really important. Even if you haven't taken like 042 or 006, there's this cheat sheet that I use for runtime that I thought was really helpful. Um, and then how you approach the problem. So are you using the right data structures? Are you using the right algorithms that, that they expect? Even if you're not, if you do something that's like O of N squared, sometimes that's okay. If you do something that's O of N, which is like the time to iterate a list that is of length N, that's probably better. Um, and then some companies don't care whether or not your solution is correct, but some do. Um, but efficiency usually matters a lot and you also have to be fast because you don't have that much time. Uh, here are some links that are helpful for this. Oh, and then for some technical interviews, they ask you about projects. I talked about Instaspam a lot because that was literally the only like meaningful project I had. Um, and that was that was honestly enough. So you don't have to do too many things, I think. Um, and behavioral interviews, there's this thing called STAR. So situation, task, action, results. So let's say you're asked to talk about a conflict, talk about the context, talk about what you're asked to do, talk about what you did, and talk about the long-term effect or like later effect of that. Um, these are more examples, there's more on the internet, but for some behaviorals, they also ask you about your, your resume or like your projects again. And then for some companies, they have like a hiring manager or systems design interview. I was lucky enough to never have a systems design, but I did have hiring manager interviews. Um, we actually know I did have one systems design, but I didn't realize it was a systems design until after I did it because I didn't know what a systems design interview was. Um, so it's usually less common than like a technical or behavioral interview. And the hiring manager, if you get to that round, usually means like you're basically at the end of the process. And sometimes it's purely behavioral. So I remember like when I was interviewing with Bloomberg, it was just this guy talking to me and asking me whether or not I liked my interviewers. Um, and you can check these out if you want to learn more about systems design, but sometimes you won't ever have to do them, but it's just good to have it in the back of your mind. Um, oh, I thought there was something else here. Okay. But yes, yeah, so like, I guess the big takeaway from this is, um, you might not see a systems design, but it's also nice to be prepared. And oh, like companies will tell you what to expect. So they'll tell you whether or not you're going to have a systems design or whether or not you will have one. Yeah. Um, again, just emphasizing that it's very different for different companies. So like some companies have like one round, some have 
many rounds, um, depending on how they decide to evaluate students. Um, and yeah, that's like basically it. So if if the process like works in your favor, then you can accept an offer, make money and develop all your web dev skills. So if you get to work on a web dev project or if you get to work on other things, um, you will nonetheless be improving your coding skills and your software engineering skills. I think a big disclaimer though, is like recruiting is very, very like, it's just a game of luck. I honestly personally feel like I was just mostly lucky to get um, the offer that I did. I could have also not gotten any, which would have been fine because there's so many other things you can do. Um, apart from like doing like specifically a software engineering internship. Um, and it's also hard and long. I recruited for like biotech before recruiting for SWE and biotech was a lot easier in my opinion. Um, SWE makes you do all these like practice questions and like leak code. So yeah, it's not the end all be all. Um, but yeah, good luck if you decide to translate your web lab skills into a job because it doesn't hurt to make money. Thank you.